I think there's very, there are very few places on earth where the confluence of political and economic and social change has been as dramatic over the last 10 years or so as in Northeast Asia. And that is the regional context within which we all try to deal, <coughs> excuse me, with North Korea. There are several characteristics of this changed context. Uh, first of all, there is, and I think all discussions of Northeast Asia must start with the obvious, and that is there is the rapid rise of China and the way in which Chinese growing influence, growing economic power, has changed all other relationships within the region. Uh, that is not to say that other countries don't count. It's not to say that only China is a factor in determining regional relationships. Uh, but it is to say that things ain't what they used to be, and they never will be again. Uh, the, one of the ways I try to describe what has happened is to note that in contrast to the years of the Cold War, uh, there is now more than one magnetic north on the geostrategic compasses of the governments of the region. It used to be that previously governments in Northeast Asia and indeed in much of the rest of the world looked to Washington to discern how they should posture their country and their policy. And everything tended to be uh, positioned around what was seen to be Washington's view. Now there is another geostrategic magnetic north on that compass, and that is Beijing and countries in the region because of the political influence of China and perhaps even more importantly because of China's growing economic weight, uh, countries must take account of Chinese views on issues on which 10, 15, 20 years ago we never really asked ourselves what China thought because we were not dealing with China in, in the same way that we're dealing with them now. Uh, so that, I think, is the principal change in some ways. But other changes have occurred in the context which are also, uh, also have great influence on the making of policy and the effectiveness of that policy. Uh, one is, for example, the growing economic regionalization in East Asia in general and Northeast Asia in particular. Increasingly, it's not really possible to talk about the South Korean economy, the Chinese economy, the Japanese economy, the Thai economy. You have to talk about all of them together in, because what happens in one, as we first saw vividly in 97 and 98, has a profound effect upon what happens in others. And increasingly, uh, production and investment in East Asia are regional phenomena. They are not limited to national uh, issues. Uh, this is not just, as we all know, a function of increased North American or European investment in Asia. Increasingly, the regionalization, this formation of a regional market, is driven largely by investment flows within East Asia itself, by money coming into China, for example, from uh, Korea. If you look now at where Hyundai produces more automobiles, uh, increasingly that is outside of Korea. It is in China, and of course it is increasingly in the United States. The same can be said for every major producer of goods in Korea they are all increasingly looking at first a regional and then a global strategy to try to figure out how to position their production platforms, how to position themselves so that they're able to serve these rapidly emerging new markets within East Asia. In addition to the economic dimension of regionalization, there is, it seems to me, a very important social dimension, and that is the unprecedentedly rapid growth of what one might call an Asian middle class. This is a group that didn't even exist 15 years ago except perhaps in Japan. But now there is a growing segment of the East Asian population, 
certainly a majority in Japan, I would argue a, increasingly a majority in South Korea, and a rapidly expanding minority in China, where people are making decisions on the basis of the same kinds of economic incentives that people in North America and Europe make decisions. Uh, I think what we've done in Febu on February 13 is we have agreed to negotiate and we have put in place, even that seems suspect at the moment, but we've put in place the first step on what is going to be a very long and very steep path. Uh, but we have not put ourselves in a position where we've answered that strategic dilemma or addressed that. For, from the point of view of the U.S., I think the real strategic dilemma is whether or not there is any agreement with any kind of international inspection which is sufficient to give people in various political groups in this country some level of confidence that North Korea has indeed given up its nuclear ambitions. And I don't think we'll know that for a long time, certainly not until the negotiations have proceeded a lot further than they have. Uh, there is, it seems to me, one kind of central issue that we have to deal with, and I think we, the, no, the February 13 agreement may be a start there, but we all tend to focus on the nuclear issue, understandably. This is, for some of us, an existential issue. But the fact remains that here at the heart of Northeast Asia, arguably the most important economic and strategic region of the world. Certainly it is, I think, one of the two most important regions for the United States. Here at the heart of this region we have a failing state which will continue to cause vibrations of instability which will uh, affect all of its neighbors and all countries with a major interest in the region that being the United States. Now, don't misinterpret this. I'm not making a call for regime change. Uh, but I am making a call for a long-term strategy that seeks to deal with this, this very important issue and in which uh, we at least have formulated some goals as to what we think would be a reasonable way to try to address this. One of those, it seems to me, has to be some form of a more normal relationship between the U.S. and North Korea. If for no other reason than that's what North Korea continues to insist is the sine qua non for their behaving in a less abrupt and less disruptive fashion. Uh, secondly, I think we should be working toward a permanent peace arrangement on the Korean Peninsula. This means replacing at some point in the far future perhaps, but at least articulating it as a goal, replacing the armistice with a permanent peace agreement. And thirdly, I think that we should begin to treat the six-party process increasingly not just as a device with which to address the nuclear issue, but as a, an essential mechanism for managing the instability produced by this failing state North Korea over the long over a long period of time